Don't yeah, panic. Yeah, don't yeah. panic. Don't panic. Don't panic. Don't panic. Don't panic. <laughs> Something really weird happens when two people get to share a car journey. You know, you get relaxed, you say things about yourself, things you normally wouldn't share. Mate, I could sit here and say to you, do you know what, oh, mate, I'm a real hard man, I've done this. Mate, I've tried on numerous occasions to kill myself, right? And I don't say it lightly and blasé, I say it because I'm okay with you thinking I'm vulnerable. I'm okay with that. Auto Trader has given me some cool cars like this one, and I'm using the power of persuasion to get people you know and love to share some of their deepest and darkest, and you get to see it all. I'm going to turn off your heated seat. Yeah, please do, because I feel I like I peed myself about like five <laughs> hours ago. I've got silly smug man face on again today because uh, I'm driving a car that I absolutely love. Uh, today I'm driving a Range Rover and it's been picked by a rugby legend. Uh, today I'm going to be driving around and chatting to Gareth Thomas who has become known just as much for what he did on the pitch as what he's done off the pitch as well, for good reason. Because Gareth is one of, if not the first, sportsman to come out in the way that he has done as gay. And as a result, has definitely shifted the needle when it comes to rugby. But the question is, will his attitude and his desire to change things affect sport as a whole. Hello, is. bud. I love being the driver in this scenario, especially when the car is as nice as this one, mate. My dream was always to own a Range Rover. Really? Always to own why a was Range this, Rover. Like, why was this car sort of a pinnacle for you? Well, I think kind of where I come from is kind of very farmy area, and the people who'd always done quite well in life mm. had Range Rovers. Yeah. And I just think at the end of my career, I thought, you know what, I, ha I have worked hard and I can treat myself. And my one treat was... A Range Rover. Was the Range Rover. That's so nice. When did you actually pass your test? I'm actually, I'm the world's worst driver. Passed my test after about like four times. My spatial awareness is absolutely terrible. Right. So if I can get through a gap, me walking, then I feel like, well, surely I can get All through right. the gap in this so car. this situation now, I would, are you going to have a panic attack? I would not go through that gap in the middle now. <laughs> are you I talking about? Yeah. Look at the space of it. All right, come on, don't panic. Don't yeah, panic. Yeah, don't yeah. panic. Don't panic. Are they breaking in don't front? Panic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm breaking in front. Oh, mate, I, I, I can feel the anxiety coming through good, there. Man. I'm not genuinely not good. You were actually married to a woman. Yeah. Prior yeah. To, to, to coming out yeah. as gay. Yeah. Um, so for your family and for your friends, uh, they'd known you, as well as people from a professional yeah. uh, standpoint, they'd known you to be uh, heterosexual yeah. for such a huge part of your life. Did that play a part in the decision that you wanted to make in terms of being so open about who you really were and how you truly felt? I'm sure you have, I'm sure everybody on this street has at some stage. You'll come to a crossroads of making a decision in your life. Firstly in my life as a young life is, do I be open about my sexuality or do I please everybody else around me and continue playing rugby because I felt at the time that I couldn't couldn't do two, couldn't do the both for a reason that you know like when I played at a younger age, I played a game of rugby with a guy who played on the wing with us, a famous rugby player called Glenn Webber, and he was a black guy and he played on the wing, mm. and I spent 80 minutes throwing bananas at him for the full 80 minutes. And do you know what? They were allowed to do it. They got away with doing it. Nothing yeah. was done about it because this was the time. This was the era. This was the place I was living was in. What sort of time this was this? This was like early 90s. Jeez, I was really hoping you were going to say 80s no, at least. No, no, my early 90s. Oh my God, wow. Um, and when that's happening, right, and I'm standing on the field thinking to myself, do you know what? I know I'm different. I don't know what makes me different because I'm not being open to myself about it. But if I speak about my differences and they can do that to Glenn, for 80 minutes, for doing something that he can't hide because it's, it's his colour, I can hide my sexuality. Do you know what? And then I don't have to go th through that. So I made the difference to doing that. But then mm. as life went on, things happen and, you know, I woke up every single day lying to a woman that I'd fallen in love with because I told her I'd loved her because I thought I loved her. And... We had a life together that made me, made me love her. But I realized that when I say to her every day, look, I love you, go to work, go to sleep, I love you, there's a part of me was lying to her. And there came a moment where, do you know what, I'd attempted suicide on many really? occasions because, not because I was gay, because I just didn't want to lie anymore to the people that I'd loved. Like, I didn't want to wake up to them or lie to my family, lie to my wife anymore because 
Like lying's not a nice thing. It's not a nice thing to do. And when you do it every single day, then lies are like this cobweb of mess that you create. And every lie you make, it makes that cobweb big, bigger. And you're just stuck in the middle. And you just think, there's no way of me getting out of this. So I used to go to this beautiful cliff near where we lived. And what I would do is every day, I would go one step closer to the edge of the cliff because wow. going one step closer to the edge of the cliff meant that I attempted my suicide that day. One day it was like, right, okay, I can't get any closer now with going off the edge. So I don't know why, but I took all my clothes off, stand on the edge of the cliff, wow. and I folded them up perfectly and placed them in a perfect pile because my image was is that when my parents came, they would see... They'd see that I'd have, le I'd, have, I'd have left things in a way that they would have wanted, wanted to be left. So you'd be like, oh, fuck you. Oh, he never folds his clothes and he does it on the one time that I don't want him to. So why is that still such a painful memory for you? Because it kills me, mate. It hurts me to think. Like, and that's why I'm really passionate about um, why, I, why I want to keep fighting for it because I vowed to myself I would never forget what it feels like to want to die because if I forget like if I forget how it feels to 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 die if I, if I forget how it feels to want to die then I'll never know what it's like to want to live because I I realize what it means to me and what that means to other people so the time it came that I can't take another step without going over the edge was the time I realized that I've got to start living because I can't die I've got something else to give to this world, like something else to make my family proud of me. So, mate, for, for what it's worth, I'm really glad you made that decision. Cheers, bud. Because just having this conversation is going to help somebody. Yeah. I've got nothing but admiration for you in doing that. Thank you, bud. No, I genuinely do. It's, Thank it's you. incredible. I decided firstly to tell my wife. She's a great person, you know, she took it in a terrible way, but we ended up staying together for a while. She was the first person that, that, that I was honest with. And after everything had, had calmed down with her and my family and I told, I told a lot of my mates, then I decided to be honest, honest with everyone. So it was about two and a half years later. It was a specially timed day, right? Because what I was gonna do in the morning, I was gonna announce my sexuality as being gay, right? But in the same day in the afternoon, I was gonna be doing what I wanted to be known for more than anything else and I was playing rugby. So I decided to take the field in the afternoon. And I remember the day of the game, right, we walked into the changing rooms. Hmm. Everyone's kind of all on edge because they're all, they, there's this strange atmosphere in the ground because everyone's like, oh my God, I, you know, Alfie's made this big announcement. And we walked in the changing rooms, I was playing for Cardiff Blues, right, and we wear blue. But on that day, the kit man had decided, or the coach had decided, we were going to wear our second strip, which was electric shock in pink. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no way, man. And I walked in, and a lot of my mates, the rugby guys, they said, Alfie, bad, we've got this because of your announcement today. <laughs> and it was great because it was like this icebreaker. Yeah. But for me, right, there was this moment that I was, I was dreading that whole day. And now, when I play rugby, right, I constantly feel like I'm part of a team. Never feel like I'm on my own or anything, right? right? But there is a moment when even in a team sport, you're on your own and that's on the team announcements. When they like announce your name, yes. a couple of seconds pause and the name after. Well, the, the stadium reacts. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. It was support <laughs> or, or <the> hostility. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And mate, I remember it loud as if it was yesterday. 70,000 fans cheered as loud that day for me as they did for, for any, oh, any of the players. And I remember a special moment, right? Because I stood on the field and for the first ever time in my life, I was myself. I was myself. I remember I was like, like I'm proud, man, I'm super proud man, I'm a super passionate man, I'm a super yeah. patriotic man, but never in my entire life had I stood on a rugby field being an honest man. And I was just, I stood there thinking, you know, nothing really changed to that minute. Yeah. Apart every, from the fact that everything changed. <laughs> I was just honest. All of a sudden, I'd been accepted for what is a value of, of any good human being and that's honesty what happened after that did you face any resistance or backlash at all or was it just constant support no you? mate I did I've always wanted to play rugby league so I decided to play professional rugby league and I went to the super league and we went to Castleford I stand on the field and I thought oh my god what, what's that what can I hear there mm. and I just started hearing these chants with my name in it 
And I remember it was for like 80 minutes, I got constantly abused. And then, again, a powerful thing happened because I went in the changing rooms at the end of the game and I was so down. I was thinking to myself, do you know what? Just walk away now. Like, you don't need to be able to, you shouldn't have to take this. You were ready to quit. I was ready to quit. I was ready to be done, like. But Castleford fans that day, some who weren't chanting, had filmed the people who were chanting. Wow. And had sent that to the governing bodies of the rugby league. And then because of that, every club in the in the rugby league in the super league that year had was sent um a charter having to sign to say that no homophobic abuse at any ground will will be tolerated It'd be yeah. a zero tolerance and i was like do you know what wow. like i didn't come out right i didn't was open about my sexuality to become like a martyr or to change change the world or the sporting world i did it because i didn't want to die i did it because i wanted to live right um and i wanted to live and carry on playing rugby but I quickly realised that I was the first person in this sport to ever do this. So when you're the first person to do something, you're <laughs> going to come across negativity, but also that negativity is somehow going to create change for somebody, somebody in the same sport after you or somebody in other sports or in other societies and walks of life yeah. to change and be who they are going to be as well. So I quickly realised, my word, actually, I'm kind of blazing a bit of a trail here. But to do that, I'm going to have to face negativity. What that done as well, it also gave me a drive to whatever else I do in life is to fight for acceptance of people who potentially don't have the same voice that I have through this, the power of sport being able, being able to have and talk for, for other people and help other people who are in the same situation that I was and I continuing to go through. Well, maybe you can help me understand this because I have my suspicions. It's obvious just by sheer numbers that there must be more gay men and women in professional sport. Well, the, Surely there's more. Well, the, the, the sad thing is, you know, Mom, mate, obviously, obviously you're not wrong and everyone knows obviously that that is not the case. But yet we still live in a world where we're accepting such a small amount of people to be allowed to be openly gay within this sport. And when I say be, be allowed, it's like to be able to compete and be judged on their abilities rather than their, their sexualities. I just got abused by, um, by a, a gang of kids in Cardiff. How many? I'd say about eight or nine. And what sort of age were they? Um, between 16 and 18. The police were saying, right, okay, we're gonna deal with, deal with this as, like, could be as a hate crime and then obviously for the attack um, potential of GBH, ABH. And I was like, right, okay. And then I seen a, a group of young adults turn into a group of kids very quickly. It's my opportunity here of dealing with eight young adults and showing them that a homosexual man actually has done something for them that's good and it's not in a negative way. So I decided to say to the police, like, mate, I don't want to charges as long as they apologize to me and understand how they've affected me you know i don't want to get over the top or dramatic about about things but it's moments like this that i realize how lucky i am to do what i do because this conversation is is really special and i can't thank you enough for being as open and honest as you've been one of the things that i think has become a huge part of what I'm known for um, over the years is is people and how important people are to me. And it's crazy because, you know, sportsmen aren't really known for that. Uh, but I think you are and might just be defined by that as opposed to what you did on the field. And I don't know how you feel about that, but I think that's a, a pretty amazing thing. I feel very humbled by that because it means that the hard work is all worth it. <laughs> Listen, real pleasure. Real Mate, pleasure. Pleasure Lovely was mine, you. Reg. Thank pleasure you so was much, mine. Right? Thank you, my friend. You take, take care. care, bud. Take it easy. Drive safe. Bye-bye. See you later, Alfie. Special awareness. Yes. See you later, bud. See you later, mate. Well, he is possibly one of the nicest men I think I've ever met, and he's got very good taste as he picked this lovely car that I got to drive around in today. And I'm going to stay like this for a little while now because hopefully people looking out of those windows and those windows over there will think I actually own this car. Remember, hit like and subscribe for me pretending that I own the cars that I drive in these videos. You can see loads more if you do just that. Bruno. Next time I'll be sharing the car with Frank Bruno, 
A man known for his incredible achievements in the ring, but also known for his incredible work in mental health advocacy. I mean, Reggie. <laughs>